let's pray. Somebody want to pray for this tonight? Dear Lord, thank you for your word tonight and uh, the blessing it brings. And um, we hope to absorb and learn um, as much as we can to follow in your ways. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Right, and so we're starting um, a series on the book of Romans, and that's no mean task, I can tell you. Um, it's going to be something where we've got to go over some things time and time again it's it what it does the book of romans it splits salvation into its three component parts and um them three component parts is justification sanctification and glorification salvation i've been saved is an unfortunate kind of thing because it kind of just says that one thing's happened well it's not one thing that's happened it's one thing that's happened something that's happening or every day sanctification and something that's going to happen so it's got a has been is happening and will happen connotation to it the god who was and is and is to come okay it always works out in them three kind of dimensions so your salvation is the same um we're going to kind of outline that but what i want you to do is go to chapter 16 because that's what everyone does when they start a book of uh, book of romans we're starting with the last chapter and there's a reason for it just going to read it straight as it is Romans 16 I commend you our sister Phoebe a servant of the church in I don't know what that says Kenshira I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and to give her any help she may need from you for she has been a great help to many people including me she delivered this letter okay Greek Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus they risked their lives for me not only I but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them Greet also the church that meets at their house. Greet my dear friend Epnetius, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me. They are outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Greet Ampliatus, who I love in the Lord. Greet Urbanius, our fellow worker in Christ, and my friend Stashes. Statues. <coughs> Greet the appellers tested and approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the, group, the house of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my relative. Greet those in the household of Narcissus. I wouldn't like to be called that. Are in the Lord. Greet Tryphena and Tryphonus, those women who work hard in the Lord. Greet my friend Perisis, another woman who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who has been a mother to me. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Greet An Anicritus, Phlegion, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brothers with them. Greet Philogius, Julia, <laughs> there's all these names, and then Julia, ne Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss, all the churches of Christ, and greetings. I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I am full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason and Sosipater, my relatives. I, Tertius, wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So Paul dictated this letter, and this guy wrote this down. Okay? Uh, Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here in, enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is in the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send you their greetings. Now to him, who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Je Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden long ages in the past, but now revealed and made known through the, now get this, prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God. Right? That's why we're reading this. The prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all nations, all nations, might believe and obey him to the only wise God. Be the glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm doing that, number one, because I wanted to do like a workout from my mouth. So <laughs> 
you know, because all the names get you kind of loosened up a little bit. It's like playing a bit of guitar practice and, you know, get you... But also, we need to know a few things about this. One of the things is all nations might believe and obey him. That's G, uh, um, um, Israeli and, and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. Um, and this is a, a, a prophetic... Right, this is a the, the writings of God. Paul knew that he was writing down stuff, it seems, that was going to be inspired by God. So with that, and just a few things, you know, the meeting in homes, the amount of women who was working there, so I wanted to just sort of encourage the women that this is a really important thing to Paul. And, um, let's go to chapter 1. So this is Paul to the church in Rome, probably about 55 to 58 AD. Now, we're gonna, I'm going to miss out a lot of the stuff which is like, you know, the simple stuff, because because Bibles these days have got it anyway. You can read it and it's pretty accurate, you know, what's going on with the letter. But um, as I said, there's an overview. But what we've got to do, and you always have to do with Romans, is get past the first three chapters. Because Paul's doing something pretty interesting. And what he's doing, he's setting up the Jews for a little bit of a tongue lashing. Okay? Because what's happening, if you don't know this, it'll sound a little bit weird. And the people have said, oh, you can lose your salvation because they don't know you're talking to the, to the Jews. And what was happening with the Jews is that the Jews had the law. They were a chosen nation from God. And they had outward signs of kind of uh, God's approval, like circumcision, all the kind of clothing that they wore and all the traditions and everything. And what they were doing, they were looking down on the Gentiles who were sinners. right? And they were just getting it all wrong and everything. So we're going to probably try and get through as much as we can. But I want you to also put another spin on this as well. And try to bring some instruction on how you read a letter like this, but you see the devotional aspect of what's going on. So when you read, sometimes you read the scriptures, and you can read it and just go, well, "That's Paul writing to a church in Rome. Where's where's the devotion element? You know, why, how do I fall in love with Jesus? Because you know." Mm-hmm. And um, some of you are really good at this, and much better than me. But I'm, I'm going to try and put across as we're reading it and stop and underline the bits where we can re-fall in love with Jesus, where we can rethink upon some things and get it really deep into our DNA that we are loved by God, okay, unequivocally. Because if anything's going to be attacked in your life is the fact that God really, really loves you to a point where it's it's unimaginable love. In fact, it's not unimaginable, unimaginable in a sense because he told us with nails and blood and a cross and pain and whipping and humiliation just how much we should have suffered but he put his son, his own son in my place and that's got to, we've got to get to a place where that matters you know. and I'm talking to, you know, perhaps if you're not a Christian in here, it, that matters really to you more than anyone else but if you're a Christian in here and that's just facts, that's just data then we've got to get to a place where that's fresh again, now I'm not saying that every minute you should be crying, you know, well, tears with all mascara down your face boys you know, and it, all this <laughs> Because, you know, you're completely broken by it all day because you couldn't be able to do your job. You'd be like, oh, you know. But I'm saying we've got to get a time daily. And I know your lives are busy, but I'm saying this to me. Um, I found something out this week, and I think the Lord nudged me over it. Um, what usually happens on my way to work is I usually put some worship on, and I'm worshipping God, right? Because what we do for worship in the group is marge. It's just missing the, missing the, the thing. It's missing because I'm not supposed to be doing it right? I think God's going to send someone I actually do and if he doesn't I, I'm going to have words with him because it's just like you know you might be having a great time and all that but I'm thinking to myself are the people who meet in our home actually touching the heart of God in that, in that time when I pick up a guitar and play songs too fast is that, is that actually happening I don't know I'm not asking for a show of hands or feedback but I'm saying we have to be pressing into God and saying when we meet together we want to sing to the Lord you know because we love him and we want him to be lifted up and worshipped and praised and is that happening because if it isn't then we, we've got to ask God to send somebody who can really be gifted in that area do you know what I mean now, now I don't want I'm not asking for anything like a feedback but I'm not, I don't feel right doing that right I'll do it because I'll do it because I'll serve do you know what I mean? Are you, are you yeah. here in my heart yeah. here? Yeah. But I want it to be something where we're able to, it's a vehicle to lift us into the heavens and touch the heart of God, you know? And um, and I'll leave that there. But another thing was, uh, I've not been having that time with the Lord in the mornings because it just struck me that me and Dan have been travelling in the morning. We just start talking about physics and rockets and stuff, you know what guys <laughs> talk about, and, you know, <laughs> spillet steak and... 
Elon Musk's adventures with, you know, we're like just going about stuff. And then I get to work and we go and do our job and then I do the same. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm really dry, I'm really feeling dry. Guys, I found out that I'm missing out because I'm not having that time of worship. Even just a few minutes of just putting you some songs and just getting before Jesus and laying your heart before him and letting, you know, your love for him just come out past the cornflakes and the toast and the marmite, you know, and, and just, not, not like eat all them things in the morning, just, just to put that right, but just so that we're actually, you know, really pressing into Jesus and getting that thing. So I've made some adjustments um, and I'm going to be working on that. But part of that whole package there is devotional life. If there's nothing more important to our life than devotion, if you go away knowing Romans and knowing that we've been saved, justified, um, saved from the the, the um, penalty of sin, <coughs> sanctified, we're saved from the the being saved from the power of sin, glorified, we'll be saved from the uh, presence of sin. It's all very well having these categories in our heads, but if our, if our hearts aren't touching the heart of God on a regular basis, I'd say at least daily if you can, then we're going to go and shrivel up like a little prune, mm. and our Christian lives are going to be not three-dimensional, not multi-dimensional. You know, and I'm talking to me, and the only reason I can do it is because that's where I've been, and that's where I'm trying to get out of, and trying to get to a place where you know there's a devotional, a real devotional. I'm not a tokenistic one, not like a just going to read a bit of uh, Philippians, you know, and chant in the car, you know, some verse that I'm trying to. There's nothing wrong with not chanting. There's a lot wrong with chanting for the wrong reason, but learning and repetition, all that's all right. But touching the heart of Jesus, getting all that stuff right. That's where I'm going to try and pull some things out of you and say, this is how you see and, and, and dwell upon these things. The word meditate has got bad connotations in today's world. But what it actually means is to chew over, to chew the cud, to, to just keep chewing over. That's the true meaning of it. And that's why the, the word says meditate on his word day and night. Okay, Keep thinking these things over. Keep these things fresh in your mind. And don't lose your connection with your source, the risen Christ. So Romans, all right, so it's, um, I've already let some of the cat out of the bag for the first three chapters. The Jews, the Jews were valuing their chosenness and their um, Jewishness and all that stuff. And it had become a pride thing where they were saying, we have the, we're the ones who belong. We're the people who are children of the covenant. Look, we've got the law. The law was given to us. No, 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 no. We've got the law, right? So we, we're, we're special. But what was happening, and we'll find out in the text, that they were just as, as sinful as the Gentiles. But while looking down on the Gentiles and saying, look at you, right? They themselves had missed the fact that a label that says Jew, chosen by God, isn't the point. The point is, are you walking this stuff out? And then he later on in chapter three, he he he, further, he goes further with that and says, no one's righteous before God. You can't fulfil the law. Gentiles haven't even got the law in mind, and even if they do walk it out, they're doing it because it's written on the heart. If somebody does walk it out well, you know. But no one's right before God. And the reason why I have to do that is because if we do this chapter by chapter, it's not massively clear where it's going, and then there's a week in in, in between, and you might lose the thread of the whole scenario Paul setting up the Jews so that he can say to them right you're the ones who look snobbery, snobbily down at the um, at the Gentiles and they are sinning and it's absolutely depraved no one's getting off the hook but you're doing the same things but priding yourself on identity isn't it true that in I've been in churches and I've done this before in the in the distant past where because I'm a Christian and because I'm part of a church that's really really doing well it's got loads of numbers and it's doing well it's got a, a, a national profile and we're becoming famous in our own dinner times you know what I mean that became the, that became the focus and not the actual thing of grassroots walking out a Christian walk before God okay and that can happen it, many things can rise up as an identity within us and mask the fact that we're not actually walking well you know what I mean this is what Paul's concern is this is what Paul's concern is um, now, don't mishear me and say that God's looking for perfection or you're banished. No, we're being sanctified. We're in, we've been brought into the family, and now Papa, Daddy, is smacking our bottoms and sometimes sending us to our room. 
but always, you know, while while disapproving of the sin, still a fatherly love <coughs> appears in that relationship, and yeah. and and that's the thing where I, I suppose it's kind of Paul saying, "Be careful where you're at," because yeah, you're looking down the sin and stuff like that, but then you're looking at yourself like, "Oh, I'm a Jew, I'm saved because I'm a Jew." I'm better than you everyone because I'm a Jew and then as you said doing the same sort of things and then God can't really get you at that point because you're not admitting that you're actually doing anything wrong yep. and it makes it difficult for him to then go okay yeah work on you so it's almost like I was thinking it in these terms if Jesus said this which he hasn't said by the way so don't do it wear a big top hat here's a cane and a cloak and walk down the street because that's what the outward sign of being a Christian is like how long would it be until you were looking at others who didn't have that going, where's your cane? Where's your cloak? God, give me this. Mm-hmm. Then you've missed it. Because what you've done is you've missed the fact that you were, you've you only got that outward... I mean, it's, it's different for a Jews, but I'm just trying to overstate the point. And they, they just failed to walk it out and they said, look at our finery, look at our chosenness, look at our um, credibility before the world, you scum of bags, and we're the ones who have got the law. And Paul's saying, no, you're doing the same things. That's what you should be looking at. Is that so. still a case today? Because I've met uh, what one Jewish person was telling me, you know, they wouldn't dream of marrying someone outside of. Their that's faith. because the law, if, they, if they're observing law, which is ridiculous because they can't slaughter animals and there's no temple, but um, if they're observing law, they're not supposed to marry outside of Israel. So, I mean, they did over years, but. We're not supposed to anyway. But the point being is that in our, I'm, I'm assuming that we're, you're all a little bit like me. I don't really meet Jews. I don't think I don't. And um, and if I did, I'd be able to probably just talk a little bit to them. But I don't feel called and sent to them. That doesn't mean that we don't pray for Israel and Israel will be saved. Okay. So um, and we're going to get onto that in this the latter half because it's all. This is about initially salvation. What does salvation mean to Jews and Gentiles? Mainly Gentiles. And towards the end, Paul radically clarifies just what's going to happen with the Jews who have been, uh, the, the, the covenant was handed over to the Gentiles. Um, so they temporarily, they've been temporarily through the ages, put on hold. You know. But they're still grafted in, so, well, in fact, we're grafted into their covenant, so the covenant's still, was that ended? That When we were grafted in the covenant, that their covenant still... Still goes. Sorry. The the new all any, every covenant that's ever been done has been done to to the Jews, okay, <laughs> to Israel, sorry, and um and the re, they they rejected Christ, so um we were grafted in. so God rejected them, okay, uh, national rejection, and then um the, the um, covenant was handed over to the Gentiles, and then you know we we like you say grafted in branches, so. It makes the covenant it still to them. say grafted yeah. though, because that mean, kind of means that we then merge with that and become a new entity. I suppose it just becomes the world, isn't it? The world, like it's covenant to the world, but the Jews have then got their own covenants to fulfil as well. Wow. Yeah. Well, let's get started anyway, because there's some things I'm just going to do. Just do we want to do a straight reading of the chapter before we pick it apart? Mm-hmm. Have we got time yeah. to do that? Yeah. Shall we, shall, do, do people want to just read in a, quite a loud voice as much as they want to and then pause and then somebody else pick it up? Yeah. Uh, which Paul, way? Paul, Paul, the, the first one, chapter. First chapter. Chapter 1, Romans chapter 1. First one. Yeah. Sorry, I was asking you first one. Yeah, first one. Paul, served of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who was to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. <coughs> to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit amongst you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The wrath of God is beginning, being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in their, in the symbol desires of their heart to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worship and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their woman exchanged unnatural sexual relations, uh, natural sexual relations with unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed for, with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do do what ought not to be done. <laughs> they have come become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. With a full, uh, with, they are full of envy, murder, strife. Um, what was that? Deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God haters, uh, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They do not. Un uh, they have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Oh, might as well just finish. Although they know God's righteousness, decree that those who do such things deserve death. They do not continue to do these th very things, but also uh, approve of those who practice them. All right, so that's chapter one, thanks. Um, so he's bagging out the Gentiles there, isn't he? Sort of like saying this is not going well. And Rome was basically filthy. It was, um, you've probably seen I, Claudius on t TV. They, they didn't show the, the, the bits and what the... Um, could have done, but it was just clear what was going on with that. It was disgusting. But um, well, that was Rome, and um, there's some interesting things as we make. So first of all, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart. 
Now that in, they, in and of itself there, we've got some um, interesting stuff going on. So you've got like a progression. A serv everyone who gets saved is like a servant of God. And um, you've all been called, but not called to the same thing. So Paul there, he's telling us that he's called to be an apostle. That was his calling. God's called him forth, you know, as a Christian first. But then his, his further calling was to be apostolic. An, an apostle, apostolos is the word, means a sent one. Somebody who's been sent to do something. And it's um, in this day and age, it's all Rolexes and you know, like Porsches and stuff. But in that day, it was whips and beatings and kicked around the floor by people who didn't agree with you. You know, and it was the, it was the worst possible thing. So, but he's saying, I'm an apostle. I'm being sent, sent into the you know, like wolves with uh, sheep's clothing, sent to people who absolutely hated him. And um, and that's what um, Paul's calling was. Now, one of the reasons why he reiterates that at the beginning of his letters. It's because there were some people who went before him discrediting Paul. Because you know Paul was Saul who persecuted the church mm -hmm. and he killed Christians because they were Christians. And then he got the ro on the road, he fell off the donkey, Lord, Lord, who are you, Lord, and all that stuff. Um, I am Jesus who you persecute. And, and this happened and some people went round and didn't believe that he was a genuine apostle. And one of the reasons is because he didn't meet the other apostles in Jerusalem. Um, which he, he, he had done that, and he tells in Galatians that that's, that's what's happened. But you know they didn't have mobile phones or YouTube or anything, so he, people didn't really have anything to verify that Paul was a real apostle. So he has to keep reiterating to people that this is what's happening. So, so Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. What do you think that means? Set apart for the gospel of God. He's got a specific role. He's, mm. yeah. And what's that role? He's an apostle. To share the gospel. To share the gospel, but also to pad out what the gospel... Because don't forget, this isn't now, this was then. To tell everybody what the good news was. Yeah. And to spell it out in such a way that people are very, very clear about what the good news was. Um, you can't have good news unless it predicates bad news. So he has to also say what the bad news is. And the bad news, we all know, is that man has fallen. He's uh, fallen short of the glory of God. And um, there's a problem. In a, the, we have a fractured universe because of what happened in the garden. So when the gospel comes forth, it's not just, you know, Jesus died on a cross. It's Jesus died on a cross, but the implications of Jesus dying on a cross, being put in a tomb and resurrecting and now being glorified on his father's seat, are far-reaching than just a gospel message that a preacher says from a platform and ask someone to raise their hand and become a Christian. It's absolutely, it's, it, it, it echoes through all of history. And we'll find out from here just how, um, just how people's thinking needs to come into line with what the gospel actually is. It's good news, but it's not just good news. When we read Romans, we find out that it's absolutely bone-shattering, terrific news that a sinner is not being held responsible for his sin. The wrath of God is gone. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. There's no wrath for believers. There's no wrath. The wrath's gone. So um, what do I do about my sin? What do I do about my habits and the things that are in my life? And it's, I'm struggling. Well, we're going to find out that the, the blood of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus, forgives past sin, present sin, and future sin. So within the good news is a component called repentance, which I don't like the word because it, it's got the penance word in it, which is a Catholic thing. But let's use it anyway. I'll, recalibration's more a modern word, but no one's going to pick up on that because it's repentance is deep in the psyche of Christian life. Repentance is going to God with your dirty rags and saying, you know, well, I, I, I'm using different metaphors, but you go in there with your bin full of trash and he empties the bin. But not only that, he cleans the bin. And that's sanctification. All right, so that's the good news. If you don't think that's good news, you didn't hear what I said. It's good news. We can be forgiven of our sins. That doesn't mean, woohoo, let's go and sin. Because if that's the case, then I'd, I'd say to you, are you actually saved? Because because it's his kindness and his, his mercy that leads us to go, I want to pursue this holy God. I want to pursue this God who is, go is promising to fix me. He's promising to put me on a straight and narrow path. And he's promising to bring me and bring me, calibrate me underneath the Lordship of Jesus. That's his promise to me. 
So um, set apart for the gospel, the good news. It's good news that we're in. We're part of a good news thing. And I want to try, with my melancholic nature, to bring out the good news of this during this kind of thing because we talk about suffering a lot and this talks about suffering a lot. However, in, when we get to chapter 5, Paul's saying, and we've said this for a while in this group astoundingly, take joy in your suffering. You know? And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not there, Paul. I'm just not there. And there's some people in this group know that. I ain't, I'm, I'm not in the joy. Woo, I'm suffering. Yay! I'm like, no, nah, I'm suffering, guys. I need prayer. I need all kinds of, you know, gifts and some wine and <laughs> chocolates and to sit there and just, oh, woe is me. You know, so I've got to grow. You know, so have you noticed that, anyone, by the way? So, so yeah. So that's what we've got to do. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel. He is going to give the gospel to the world. Jesus has gained, the, he is the good news, it's all about Jesus, but Paul's been charged to to um, to meet out exactly what that's going to be. Don't you think here we've got a really good example here of a person who was known to be anti-Christian from the start, hmm. and yet he comes out with this fact, a bond servant. He's a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. He's stating his position to them very, very clearly that his responsibility of the gospel and who he was. He wasn't the Paul of old. Mm. He was the new Paul, the Paul, the servant of Christ, yeah. not the enemy of Christ. And his responsibility that he had in proclaiming the gospel. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Big deal. And he wants it's everyone to know. Yeah. yeah. So this good news has got to be, it's got to be given out to both Jew and Gentile. So he goes on, verse two, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets. Now, what people are missing a lot in, in the Christian church is the fact that before Jesus came and the good news and what Jesus was going to accomplish was done, it was all prophesied to have happened up to that point. But what, but the problem was it was it was all supposed to happen to Israel. So when you see it in the prophets and it says this is going to you'll be restored and that has been as at a 2000 or whatever it will be gap so that the Gentile, the full number of the Gentiles can come in because the gospel, the, um, the covenant was handed over to them. Um, in a sense it was handed over to them. They were invited to the party more than it was handed over to them. Um, but the prophets already spoke that this was going, to, was going to be a good thing. What we've got to watch about doing, though, is saying that everything that it says for Israel is actually for the church. Right? So that's a mistake, because it's not necessarily true. God isn't so much looking at the prophets, the, the word of God that's been written, so he can move. <coughs> he can move independently of that within its structure. Do you know what I mean? So it's not like because he said it to Israel it will happen to the church because a lot of the church thinks that they are Israel and it's just not correct to say that. Okay, and because um, Israel's Israel, you know we're the Gentiles, and um, but all the promises are yes and amen in Christ. So there's work to do to say what's been what's been specifically said to the nation of Israel and yet to be fulfilled. What's been said to the anyone who comes God's beloved who comes to Him in repentance and what's the God's promise to that. Uh, person, and you know, so there's, it's not as, and, and we're told to rightly divide the word of God in, in in the scriptures. So we've got to, so don't panic and don't sit there and go, this is more complicated than I thought it was. It's not. Just do what Helen's really good at, and I wish it was like that, and just say, Jesus died, He rose again, He's on the throne. I can go to Him with anything, and that's what I do on a daily basis. You know, it doesn't get messed up with all the stuff. You know, about Jew and Gentile and. You know, it's good to know it. It's good to have a background knowledge. But needle to the thread, if you're really obsessed with it, it'll just spoil your walk with Jesus because you'll be constantly panicking. Do I know enough? Is it? Am I in the right place? Is Israel in my mind today? Did I pray for Jerusalem? You know, you're like going, just be led by the Spirit. You know, don't let this knock you off the kilt or anything like that. So, the gospel promised through his holy prophets, uh, the holy scriptures. That's the Tanakh uh, regarding his son who was as human nature, was a descendant of David. So it, so he's, he's stressing the humanity of Christ, um, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God. What declared him to be the genuine article? We saw the miracles. We, you know, you got the miracles, you got a lot. I didn't believe in it. The miracles didn't really move people. All right? 
what was the thing that said this was the son of God the resurrection it says it there doesn't it um, the, by the resurrection of the dead so the resurrection is what signs off on this was definitely the Messiah okay and everyone's got to, through this street has got to go well all right then. Um, yeah Jesus Christ our Lord five and this is in this is what mine says I think yours was slightly different Amory through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith does it say that? I, I think that somebody said it at the end. It doesn't matter because Greek's not sin. It hasn't got uh, syntax. Mine says, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith from his name's sake. So with this, it doesn't matter where that's put in the sentence. But what is important is that your salvation and your walking this out isn't dependent on you. It's dependent on the name of Jesus. His reputation is online. For you to come through this and, and and come through it well do you see what i mean i'm talking to true believers now there's believers out there who do just do a an hand up raised ascent to jesus and then it all goes wrong and it's all kind of a worldly walking out and paul talks about this in here you know you, you just you're not really there you're just going through the motions and you haven't really got a religion or a faith you've actually got like uh, a mental ascent to data but it doesn't walk out in true you know um holiness um, through him and for his name's sake we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles the obedience that comes from faith so Paul's again reiterating his kind of uh, his calling there don't forget this is the dialogue if there's anything that's not clear um, and you are also among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ so Paul can't possibly know the specific calling of everybody in Rome but he say you're all called, called to belong to Christ, to Jesus Christ. And that's what being a Christian is. You are called to belong to Christ. Now that has got to be a devotional point. You're belonging to your Saviour. Selah. <laughs> the belonging in that is a love relationship. Belonging to Jesus Christ. So if you're struggling to think, you know, I'm really sure I've got a dry time, just dwell on that tomorrow in your car, or on the train, or while you're walking. Just that word, I belong to Jesus. I'm the personal property of my Saviour. He's, he's not just saved, I'm not just a theological, you know, uh, the, the, the products of a theological fact that God saves, and I'm just one of those who got saved. You, personally, belong to Jesus. And um, that, that, I think, is is a real devotional part if you, if you struggle to find and pick them out of the text so Paul's introduced himself verses 1 to 6 and he said he's setting himself up he's kind of setting himself up in the in the, uh, the captain's seat if you like this is what it is I'm an apostle I'm going to be saying these things with some level of authority and um, we're talking about Jesus it's about Jesus and the resurrection and we're going to be obedient to that and do what we are told to do and here is the start of the letter properly to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints okay saints just means set apart ones okay people who are set apart from this been taken out of the world um, um, whole is the same thing saints whole to be set apart to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be set apart is basically what's going on there um, there's another devotional to all in Rome who are loved by God and this seems so like fundamental to the way we live our Christian lives. Yeah, I know God loves me, but I don't. You know, sometimes I've been flippant with that. Sometimes I've been like, it's just a theological fact. But instead of searching out the heart of God and saying, "Hey, I'm never going to really plow, plumb the depths of that love," I can't understand what motivates the cross because that's such what love is. This amazing love, such sacrifice. You know what? is that what gives his own son so that me a wretch can be saved can't fathom it but what I've got to do what we you know we've got to get to a place where we're going Lord give me a glimpse of that love and not a glimpse so that I can have goose pimples or a nice day today but a love so that I can glimpse a, a fraction of your love that's contained in that act 
and somehow that radiates from me into my context and then I can be light to the world because that's that's what it is that's the thing it's, it's other than it's another than love and um, I know the Lord wants to issue forth we've said it in this group before Jesus inside you and he's trying to get out he's trying to get out through you through through all the things that we do and um, so I don't know I'm not conducting your devotional life but maybe you know love by God is something that might just trigger something and you might want to spend a bit of time on that while you're you know walking through Subway or you know ordering your McDonald's and you know whatever you do you do all that kind of thing so I'm going to do that tomorrow grace and peace see that's a sermon grace and peace um, to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ that's a devotion did you know that right now God the Father and Jesus Christ are saying to you grace and peace grace and peace to you I'm not turning the I'm not the one turning the screw I'm not causing the problem I'm not doing that he knows that they exist but he's saying grace and peace I'm, not, I'm, I'm this is what you get from us it's just emitting from us grace and peace all the time so you know we can sometimes go over that and sometimes miss it that, that that's the thing but the intention is grace and peace remember Christmas when the angels were like goodwill to all men because the saviors come and now we post that and we, we've been privileged to be in the end times you know what I mean and it's all still true and it's still goodwill to all men grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus if you ever think that I mean I can be you know I get some times when I'm like oh this is just hard you know and um, not having had the best parental setup um, you know I can struggle with the fatherhood of God still do still trying to work it all out and but I, I just reiterate it all the time grace and peace that's his intent you know, and if you if you if you you know you've got strife at the moment, if you've got neighbours who are trying to kill you, like, and all that kind of thing, um, just grace and peace, and let that settle in your heart. Just go, you know. The Father declares peace between you and Him. The Father declares <coughs> peace. He declares it. No peace. Yeah, but I'm not feeling very peaceful, Lord. Yeah, but I'm. I'm well, be how you want to be. I'm very peaceful towards you. You know, as long as you're repenting and you're not in continual sin and you're intending to walk well, peace. Jesus did it, shed blood. Eight. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Now, <laughs> there's a church in Rome. Rome is like the filthiest place going. It's the centre of everything hedonistic and everything that's wrong with everything. The, um, there's a bit of history there because the um, Babylonians ended up in Rome okay? because when they, because they had to get out of Babylon because the Mede Persians took over they went to Pergamos and then they went to Rome okay? so there's like a lot of occult, dark, sensuality aiming for... Um, well, we're going to read it later so I'm no need to keep going so what time are we on? Uh, 7.54 Okay, I've got six minutes to do the rest of this chapter. That's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Yeah. Let me just do a bit more. First, I thank my God through for all you because your faith has been reported all over the world. There's a church in Rome. They can't believe it. It's like what? There's a church in that hedonistic place, and um, you've been all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching with the gospel of His Son, is my witness. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. And we find out at the end of Acts that he does go to Rome. Okay, he's got dual citizenship. Um, no, he has, though. Isn't I'm not he a Roman? He, he's got dual citizenship. He's, he can go to Rome, and even if the Jews have been kicked out, he can still go. I thought so, he was Roman by birth, wasn't he? Um, well, he's, he's, he's after, he has to be Jewish because he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Ah, okay. Yeah. No. He was the the Benjamite of Benjamites so I long to see you 11 I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong and this is great that is just to clarify that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith so there's you know when we're talking about the aim of the church isn't primarily evangelism it just isn't the aim of the Ecclesia, when we're looking biblically, is to mutually build up and encourage one another <coughs> with gifts. 
So all Paul's saying is, I'll just be a brother among you. He's not like got this electric coming from his hand like that, and he's just going to go, no, I'm here, everyone's going to get spiritually gifted. Zzz, zzz, zzz. He's just saying, that could be along with, uh, uh, um, I could be around you, um, and we can mutually encourage each other. Because that's what churches do. They mutually encourage one another. 13. I do not want to, you to be unaware, brothers, that I planned many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so un until now, in order that I might have a harvest amongst you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Enjoy this helicopter. 14. I am bound to both Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so, I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. But that's kind of a backhanded compliment, isn't it? I'm bound both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. So he's not like, pulling any books. What? He's, saying, he's saying amongst you is the wise and the foolish. It's just a fact. All right? yeah, you because, you and we need to sort that out. Yeah. And anyway, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, gospel a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. All right, we're going to stop and just ask questions about that and then we'll do the rest of that and probably all of chapter two because it's, it's good that this has happened because after this you could almost put in your bible don't do it because it's not good to do that but dot 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 and then verse 18 the wrath of god is being revealed from heaven right so it's kind of like even though all this is true i've introduced myself you're doing really 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 well and all this kind of stuff but the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. All right, we're not doing that now. But just to let you know, set you up for next week, it's kind of like, we ha Houston, we have a problem. And then he, he, he tells, you know, he's, he's, he's setting it up for the Jews so that the Jews can be um, ousted in their um, pride and legalism. And um, yeah, I suppose that's it, really, pride and legal legalism. So... Comments? I've got one here. It's not, I've never come across this before, but it's about the word on the servant. Yeah. And it says in here that on servant, if you're using the Greek, means somebody who was a slave and not necessarily wanted to be a slave. He had, to, he had no choice. But the Hebrew word means that he loves his Lord and wants to serve him. So you've got that different characteristic of the word bond servant. And that's how Paul was. He really loved his Lord and wanted to serve his Lord. Sure. So I only just found that out. In this yes, well, there's a bit of background to that because when the actually the slave, slave was an industry, it was like, it wasn't like slave, the slave trade. And like servants, like feeders. Yeah, like servants and all. And they were glad to be like that because they, were, they got a house, you know, roof over their head and they were looked after. And uh, when it was a Christian household, I think it, this was a rule anyway, but if it was a Christian household, they got a chance, to, after the contract had finished, they got a chance to become part of the family. And if they were, it was called bond slavery. You know, so, it, and he, he uses that because he, it's a picture what everyone knew at the time about this. And he says, I'm a bond slave to Christ. So in other words, I've chosen to do this, to, to actually serve me. Yeah. And that's, that's the point. Being I, mean, made. I suppose it also takes two sides of the coin with the Greek explanation as well. You can be in... A, a servitude as in like a religious uh, setting where you're just kind of there because you kind of made yourself slave because if you, you take part of, you've, you've embedded yourself in the church if you then chose I wouldn't I didn't want to do that you'd lose your friends and stuff like that so you kind of just do it out of almost so you don't become a social martyr as per se if you know what I mean yeah so two two sides of a different coin same mm -hmm. thing so the people in Rome are doing all right, but they're doing all right amongst, you know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, rough, rough neck of the woods, really. Mm. It's like the cent centre of, it's like planting a church in, I suppose, Kabul or something, you know, for different reasons now, but, you know, because they're totally anti-Christian and stuff, but it was just like hedonistic central. Um, That's like planting a church now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the same sort of things are happening, aren't they? Just, just to, just to bring something out, uh, just another devotional point. Uh, verse 17: For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, 
a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. And you can say, without any qualms at all, God thinks it is right that me, a sinner, can be forgiven and set free from wrath. Isn't it, isn't it awesome? He thinks it's right. He says, let's just turn to Ephesians just to finish this, because we always do this, don't we? And we forget what Ephesians says. Just beautiful, the first chapter of Ephesians. Do you know that Rome was a built in the day? <coughs> Damn! It took a fortnight, didn't it? Or something? Something like that. Okay. Ephesians. Ephesians 1, just just the stuff this year, just, you know, we're heavy on devotional tonight, just to try and, I think we've all got a responsibility to each other to get us, you know, entering into Christ and, and really getting into that thing. So, Paul, an apostle of Christ, there he is bragging again, Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is again, grace and peace, grace and peace. If you, if, if you look up to the throne and you can see the Father and Jesus sat there, I don't know, playing Scrabble or something, I don't know what it is, right? It just go, say, just say what's going on. They go, grace and peace. Grace and peace. And, and, and our acceptance of that. What was it in Ephesians? Yeah, Ephesians, Ephesians 1. 1. Yeah. And we're just, we're just not going to expound this at all. I'm just going to read it because I want you to see how with a big smile on his face, with good pleasure, and this is only because of the finish with Christ, and the resurrection and all that, because the um, expiation and pro propitiation, I can hardly say that, and that's a posh way and theological way of saying, not only was the sacrifice appropriate for God, but it was carried out perfectly, and the sacrifice was accepted by God, okay, fully accepted, there's no wrath, it's all gone, okay, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, so he knows blessed us, right? in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Don't forget holy, just means set apart. Okay, set apart. In love he predestined us to be the adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his, what's that word? Pleasure. And will it's pleasurable for God once the resurrection's taken place, once the sacrifice has been made, He has been appeased for all the wrath for believers. If you if you become a Christian, you are off the hook, and not only that, but you are adopted as a child as well. Okay. Um, predestined us to be adopted as His sons with the cause of His pleasure and will. It's His will for you to be a Christian today. God the Father, the head honcho, or some people think of it like that. God wills you to be a Christian and he's pleasured by your walk and even if we're stumbling and tripping up and falling the fact that you go back to Jesus and choose his way is faithfulness because you're choosing the gospel you're choosing the good news every time I'm not saying go off and sin and then come back and go hey I'm doing the good, the right thing I'm just saying if you do find yourself sorrowful and mournful because of your own you know wretchedness and which that's what it is um, then go to Jesus and don't wait for the emotion don't wait for the impact of society to catch you right? you know you've done it so just go to him and as far as the east is from the west he will separate that sin from you when you confess it to him and, um, and you know I'm not going to talk about true repentance but we need to be putting plans in to not be like that you know and the sorrow, the sorrow that God can take us through will act us upon that for sure right? and that's a sign that you're saved because you, you care about sin and you don't just go, well, you know what. Um, so his pleasure and will, five, six, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, freely given us, and the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. God didn't go, oh, Gary, oh, I forgot about you. You, you said that prayer, didn't you? 1989, summer, sometime. Oh, and then you, then somehow he got in. How did you get in it? That was my doing. No, he was going from the before creation. I, you, I was in his thoughts, and that's mind blowing. That was in his thoughts. I was there, and, he, and, and it manifested in 1989 that I was, a, I was a person set apart for the new covenant. And all these things is God's grace to you with a big smile, grace and peace, grace and peace, love, my pleasure, my will, my purposing. You're not an accident, and you're not an accident. Okay. I've got a plan and a purpose. Servant, called, chosen. And we I need to live in that space more than this is hard. I'm really stumbling along. Sorry Lord, please forgive me. 
you know, I'm going to do all them things, but I'm not going to make it the, the mark of my walk, you know, I'm going to try and be better at this. He's lavished it on us with wisdom and understanding, nine, and he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure. Don't forget mystery in the New Testament in these writings is something that is unfolded and shown to us, not something that's hidden, okay? which he purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times have reached their fulfilment to bring all things in heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ. That's the point. That's what's happening. God the Father is, 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 is the whole thing's happening to bring everything under Jesus, right? And then what will happen is that when this um, is all over with, there'll be a millennial reign of Christ where his reign will cover the earth like the water covers the seas during the flood, right? It will, it will be like that. And the air will be thick with, with the presence of joy and love and peace for those who want it, for those who want to live in that way. Now, we are, we are recipients of that seed of salvation, but we're not there. We're in a, we're in a pl time before that where we, the universe is still all fractured and it's all a bit of a mess. And your, your very presence, your very standing, your very testimony without even getting out of bed in the morning, is pushing back and not allowing evil to go forward in this world. Before you've done anything, you've won. Before you've done anything, you're already victorious because you're standing on the rock that's Christ. So there's no need to go, what did I do today for Jesus? Well, what you did is you didn't do something for the enemy. You didn't do something for self. And if you did, repent. But generally speaking, and the tale of the tape is that we're trying and intending to be people of light and not people of darkness. So with a big smile on his face and longing to hug you but not yet because you'd be dead and, yeah, anyway. but um, he, he wants to really we can we can get the grace and peace and love from God like I've talked too much now so I'm going to shut up and it's getting on so and the lights have gone out so <laughs> divine kind of thing any questions or fingers science I'm sorry the lights have gone out because of science is it okay I'll just finish in prayer. Father, we thank you because um, we can often forget and there's someone out there trying to make us forget, trying to mask the truth, trying to um, just make it all fuzzy and noisy, that you, with good pleasure and wisdom and understanding and grace and peace and love, have been pleased to give us the kingdom. It's your pleasure to give us the kingdom, Lord. Help us to get up in the morning or even get up out of our shake the dust off our clothes Lord and just stand on the rock that is Christ that has been freely given to us for our strength and forward momentum bless us all in Jesus name Lord because um, you want to bless us and uh, grace and peace to all Amen, Amen. Thank you